Uh, my dad is recovering from esophagus cancer, just had a major operation. And uh, God has been good to him and pray for my mom as she uh, as she is a, a caregiver at this time. And, and it's just one of the storms of life, isn't it? Many of you have been through that. Uh, I heard you talk this morning and pray about some other situations that are just hurtful and painful. Uh, Justin Boyer passing away. Um, my mother-in-law, Tempe, who's got terminal stomach cancer and probably... You know, she she her the recent news was not good, and so we 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 all have just things that come into our lives, don't we? Uh, I love what the psalmist says, though, that during those times we we gotta we gotta lift our eyes just a little bit higher than the circumstances. You know, the psalmist says, "Where where where am I going to look? Where am I going to go?" I'm gonna look to the hills. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look above. He was, he was looking. He was, he was talking about those hills that surround Jerusalem, and it was just a, a play on words because I'm gonna, I'm gonna look high where God dwells. That's where my help's gonna come from. So that's what I wanna. That's, that's what I wanna talk with you this morning about. If you need a title. For this message, it's, it's simply this. Why God allows the different storms to come into our life. Now, I, I'm not God, and so I, I can't, I'm not going to say that this is an exhaustive reason because I'm reminded of what God says to us in the book of Isaiah chapter 55. This is the best thing you can tell yourself when you're going through a difficult time. God says in Isaiah 55, my ways are just not your ways. And my thoughts are just not your thoughts. He said, let me, let me say it in a, in a different way. As high as the heavens are from the earth, as, as high as from where I sit than where you are, are my ways and my thoughts from yours. It's why we're told in the New Testament that the just shall live by faith. We don't know why everything happens. And even if we did, we don't know why it happens the way it happens. But God, that's where our faith is. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And we're going to talk about it through one of the miracles of Jesus Christ. So if you are able, would you turn with me to Matthew 14 and stand with me as we honor the Lord in the reading of His Word. Pay very careful attention to what Jesus says in this text. Because I believe that if you will allow God this morning... In the power of His Holy Spirit, He will assign these words to your heart, and there'll be a peace that comes in your life that surpasses all understanding. Just to kick us off, we're gonna we're gonna read Matthew chapter fourteen, beginning in verse twenty-two. Now, this is kind of right in the middle of the story, and then we'll we'll branch out from there. But this is what God. Uh, says, immediately he, talking about Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Now the other side is across the Sea of Galilee where yet another great thing is going to happen. Remember the wild man in the cemetery that Jesus brings out a legion of demons and they find him in his right mind? But we, we can't even get there yet, right? He's just saying, get in the boat and go to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Father, in Jesus' name, we give you glory and honor this morning. 
because of who you are, and that you loved us so much you took on flesh and came down here in the person of Jesus Christ, your, your precious Son, to deliver the good news, the gospel, that's found in Christ alone, who lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death, but was resurrected as a glorious King of kings, and is right now at your right hand praying for us, interceding for His children. We thank you for that. Would you speak into our humanity this morning in an area that we all understand, and that that is life is not easy, and at times extremely painful, but most of the time confusing, but that we have hope, which again is found in the gospel. We love you, Father. Thank you for loving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so, so much. So, Blake, Mom, Dad, I hope you have your Bible. Would you turn with me real quick? I, I want to give you I want to give you a preface for what we're going to talk about. Now, normally I preach this sermon in two parts, but I'm not going to be here tonight, so we're going to have to try to cram this all in this morning. So bear with me. Um, but turn in your Bible to Matthew, just back a couple chapters to Matthew uh, chapter 11. Because the same Jesus we see here in this miracle that's about to happen is the same Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. And look with me, if you will, um, beginning in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 11. Listen to what Jesus says, what Jesus promises. He says, At that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to, be, to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then there's this great statement by King Jesus in verse 28, 29, and 30. He turns to this massive crowd, and he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, before we get into the message, I want you to remember something. And this may be the only thing you remember from this whole message. And if that's, if that's good, if that's it, that's fine. But I want you to understand something this morning about who Jesus is and about who you are in Christ. From this statement right here in Matthew 11, we know th the three most important things that we can even know about God. And that is, first of all, that God knows. God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly where you're at in the circumstance. And God knows what He's going to do about it. It doesn't matter what the circumstance is. It doesn't matter what the storm is. It can be from you finally got the interview that you've been trying to get for months, but now you can't find your car keys and you're going to be late for it and your life is not going to change, all the way up to somebody being ravished by cancer or killed in a car wreck. It doesn't matter. Jesus says, I know. 
But he also says in this statement, I care. That's why he says, come to me. I care. I love you. But he also says here, I can. I not only know, I not only care, but I can. What, what do you mean, Brother Troy? It means that only God has the power to do this. Is there anything too impossible for our God? The answer is unequivocally no. So we're left with just this easy but hard thought that I'm just going to trust Him by faith regardless of what I'm going through. So now we go back to Matthew chapter uh, 14 and to where we find ourselves this morning. Before I even preach the first word, I just want to give God honor and glory uh, for who He is. Thank you, God. Thank you for just who you are. Thank you, Jesus, for just what you... What you have done. When you study the miracles of Jesus Christ, and then as you study the Word of, of God, there's something very, very important to get right off the bat. Like, I love studying the miracles, and this is my favorite miracle, the one that we're reading here about Jesus coming to them in the middle of the Sea of God. It's my favorite. Now, you may have your favorite. Note, though, that the one we're about to read is the only one mentioned in all four Gospels. So what we get there is, we get Matthew's account, but then John fills us in with details that Matthew doesn't, then Luke speaks into it, stuff that Mark doesn't say, and then Mark speaks into it. So it, we get this quad picture of this beautiful miracle of Jesus Christ. But here's what we need to understand before we get into the miracles. When you, when you say miracle of God, there's two other words that coincide with that in the Hebrew language and in the Greek language. And, and, and you're familiar with all three words. Miracle, sign, and wonder. So it all means the same thing. So don't get thrown saying, well, I don't see the miracle in this. Well, it, 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 they might use the word sign or they might use the word wonder, but it's all the same thing. But here's the beauty of studying the miracles of Christ. The word sign, which is the word miracle, is a root word of the, of the word significance. So when we study the miracles of Jesus, what we should, where we should land on it is not what actually happens in the miracle, but what is the significance of the miracle. But we get caught up in just the sign itself but we should say as, as believers who, who are walking with Jesus and trusting Him, okay, this is awesome and great, but what is the significance? Why, Jesus, did you do this? What are you trying to show us? What are you trying to teach us? And unequivocally, almost every miracle that Jesus performs is just to open the door for then, for, for, for then Himself to be able to say, this is who I am. I am who I am. I am, the, I am God in the flesh. I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. Because God doesn't always heal everybody. God doesn't always do these great miraculous things. So the significance of everything Jesus does is to point people towards Him and the message that God loves us. So with that in mind, now we can go into this story and say, what was the significance of this particular miracle? And most people get hung up on the fact, well, Jesus, or Peter walked on water. Isn't that so cool? It is cool. In fact, Peter and Jesus are the, the only two people that has ever been recorded to walk on water. But that's not the significance of the miracle. See, we're getting hung up on the sign itself and not 
what he's talking about. Let me give you an example of why that's so important. Turn back one chapter to Matthew chapter 12. And, and let me show you what Jesus says to the church, the religious leaders at that time. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 and 40. And then you'll get a clear picture here of why we got to um, focus on Christ and the significance. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, 39 and 40. Watch this. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he, Jesus, answered them, said, An evil and an adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men, uh, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. See, he's pointing to himself. And then verse 42 says, The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. We've got to see Jesus in every miracle or we're just like the Pharisees of that day saying, show us something great, God. And then when, they, when that doesn't happen exactly the way we want to, all of a sudden we devalue who Christ is. But the significance is Jesus. So let's go to our miracle. And what I want to share with you this morning are what I see in this particular miracle of why God allows certain things to happen in our life. You know, why? You've heard that old saying, why does bad things happen to good people? Well, I've got news for you. The Holy Spirit flattened me here a few months ago when I heard a preacher say, wait a minute, why does bad things happen to good people? The Bible says there's none that are good. No, not one except God. So he said the most realistic way to say that is why does good things happen to bad people? Boy, that'll change how you look at life, isn't it? I don't deserve anything. But yet God so loved me that He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross so something good could happen to me, which is bad. Thank you, Jesus. So here we go. Why does God, though, allow certain storms to come into our life? Dr. Billy Graham said, Jesus invited us not to a picnic, but to a pilgrimage. Not to a frolic, but to a fight. He offered us not an excursion, but an execution. The first reason that I feel that God allows certain things to come into the life of His people is to bring our faith under review. To bring our faith under review. Look with me, because I don't want you to just think I'm saying this. I want you to see it in the text. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 14, but now go up to verse 19. Way before the storm ever happens, way before the disciples are ever out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, look at what's happening in another miracle that happens right before this miracle that we're reading about this morning. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Remember, this is the feeding of the 5,000. He orders the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. 
Then he, Jesus, broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. We know, and you've heard this a million times, that conservatively speaking, Jesus probably fed somewhere between ten and 15,000 people that day. On the other end of the spectrum, a lot of scholars believe he actually fed upwards of 20,000 people. But it's a miracle to just think Jesus could take these little bitty loaves of bread. I've seen these loaves of bread in the Far East. And these two fish, which are like two sun-dried up sardine-like fish. And if he could even feed 5,000, but maybe 20,000. The disciples are watching him do this. Right in front of their eyes. And then what, is it, what does it say? Then he immediately says, boys, go get in the boat, and I'll meet you on the other side. I'm going to stay, stay here, and I'm going to dismiss the crowds. I'll see you in a little bit. So he dismisses the crowds. It's still daylight. The weather's good. The sun is out. But, it, but, but before he goes to the other side, what does Jesus do? He goes up and prays. So this storm that happens out there is, I think, this is just me, I really believe what the text is telling us, is he wants to see, did they learn anything in the feeding of the 5,000? He is going to just bring their faith into review. If we can trust God when the sun is shining bright, we can trust Him in the middle of a dark night. That's why Jesus says to Peter here in a little bit, Oh, oh, Peter, you of little faith. He doesn't say you have no faith. He just says your faith just isn't at the level that I was hoping it would be because what you're going to face when I go back to heaven is going to be far harder than this little storm out here in the sea. Are we growing up at all in Christ? Or are we just like the Hebrew children who time after time when God performed miracles back here, when He takes them out of 400 years of slavery and draws water out of a rock and causes quail to fall from heaven and all these things, and then just a mile down the road, they're back again just questioning God. Well, why did you bring us out here in the middle of this desert, Moses? Why? Because we're just like that. Sometimes our faith just has to be brought under review when a storm comes. But there's a second reason. Not only to review our faith, but to rebuke our pride. I don't know about you, but I struggle with pride. It's in my blood. It's in my DNA. On my best day, I am a prideful sinner against a holy God. So I got good news for you. We're in good company. So were the disciples of Jesus Christ. So sometimes a circumstance can cause us to check our pride. How do I know that? Well, again, let's look at the text. At the end of verse 23, Jesus is up on the mountain praying. Verse 24, it says, But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, He, Jesus, comes to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw Him, and said, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Pride gives birth to fear. Fear. 
faith gives birth to peace. They were trusting Jesus. But when the storm came up, have you ever had something happen in your life and when it first happens, you're like, I've got this. And it keeps rocking along a little bit and you're like, well, this is a tough one, but you know, I can do this. You know what's happening when that is happening? Your flesh is responding in fear that shows itself in pride. See, as the storm got worse and the waves got higher and the rain got harder, their pride arose and they didn't look to Christ but look to their own ability. I believe as the wind blew harder, they rode faster, but they got to a point where they said, oh my goodness, we're going to die. Because they, they, these were experienced fishermen. They've been out there in the sea many, many times. We've handled things many, many times, haven't we? But they knew that if that boat capsized, they would surely drown regardless let me tell you something. Without Jesus Christ, we have no hope. We have no hope. Whether you've lost your keys or whether you get extremely painful bad news, it's the same Jesus. We don't need to row harder. We need to trust more fully. Proverbs sixteen eighteen says, Pride comes first. And then the fall. And I'm going to be honest with you. Just like we will allow a precious child after we've told them and told them and told them, do not touch that. Now, this is going to sound sadistic, but I'm just going to say what I know you've already done in your life. There are times where I say, okay, just touch it. <laughs> right? I have told you and I've told you and I've told you that that is hot. But you know better than me. I'm just your dad. So just go ahead and touch it. And then they touch it and their world falls apart and they come rushing to dad. Oh, daddy, daddy. And you know what I do? I just love them. That's how we are with God. He knows. He cares. He can. But sometimes... He's just got to let us do it. It's the only thing that can cut pride. Proverbs 29, 23 says, Pride will do, I'm paraphrasing, Pride will do nothing but bring a man down. There's no other good for pride. Nothing good for pride except bringing you down. But God says, he opposes the proud and lifts up or exalts the humble. Let me tell you something. Right now, whether you're in the middle of a storm, coming out of a storm, or about to go into a storm, the rudder is whether you are being navigated with humility or pride. Because we don't have this. <laughs> we do not have this. So I think sometimes, as the disciples learned in the middle of a storm, sometimes it's just to bring our faith under review. Sometimes it's just to rebuke our pride. But thirdly, sometimes it's just to resurrect our prayer life. I don't know about you, but prayer is a tough discipline for me. I know I should pray. I know that there's power in prayer. I know that all these things, but do you pray the way you want to pray? I mean, some of you do, and if you do, praise God. Pray for me that I would pray more. But it's a tough discipline, isn't it? Sometimes I need my prayer life resurrected. What will resurrect your prayer life more than anything? That's for something to happen where you so need God that the only thing you know to do is to cry out to Him. Where do we see that in this story? Well, we see it when Peter finally gets out of the boat. 
and he walks to Jesus, but then takes his eyes off of him, and what happens? He begins to sink, right? All of a sudden, his prayer life just springs into action. Oh, Lord, save me! The shortest prayer in all the Bible. You don't see Peter saying, Oh, Father, art thou great and majestic and glorious in heaven? And, Oh, Father, no, save me! A storm will make you cut to the chase. This is where the other Gospels help us. Because Matthew doesn't say something here that Mark does. And this will completely blow your mind as you see this story. Listen to what Mark says in Mark chapter 6, verse 48. And he, Jesus, saw that they were making headway painfully. Jesus is watching them in the middle of the storm, and he sees that they're just rowing to beat the band. And then Mark says, so about the fourth watch. What is the fourth watch? It's around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. The fourth watch is technically from 3 in the morning till 6 in the morning. So it's probably around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. About the fourth watch... He came to them walking on the sea, but watch what Mark adds. He meant to pass them by. Whoa, wait a minute. I thought when Jesus entered the water, and by the way, he entered the same storm they were in. I thought he was making a beeline to the boat. He wasn't making a beeline to the boat. What was he doing? He was doing exactly what he told them before they got in the boat he was going to do. He was going to make a beeline to the other side. So here's the picture. The storm is raging. The waves are, are caving in, and Jesus is just walking in perfect peace. There's the boat. What stopped Jesus on the water? Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Peter prayed. I honestly believe, now, I can't be dogmatic about this because, one, I wasn't there. Two, where the Bible's silent, let it be silent. Where the Bible speaks, let it speak. But I honestly believe if they had not prayed, Jesus would have kept walking. Now, I don't know that because he's Christ. He's loving. He could have just said, you dingbats. I don't know. He wouldn't. I know he wouldn't have used the word dingbats because he's Jesus. That's the cotton patch version. Jesus intended to go right by them. If the disciples didn't learn anything that night, this storm would have taught them the importance of crying out and calling out to King Jesus in prayer. And he had just modeled it. How long was Jesus praying before he walked out? We know when we put all the four Gospels together, he was probably on the mountain praying anywhere from six to eight hours. And then he leaves. You know, one thing we learn in Oklahoma... His weather is crazy. Amen? It's crazy. Isn't it funny how weather uh, affects your clothing? Like when it's 100 degrees outside, you're not looking at the sweater closet, are you? Unless you're just a freak. But um, But when it's... 20 degrees, you're not looking at a tank top, are you? Isn't it funny how the weather affects how we dress? Life is just like that when it comes to our prayer life. When things are going good, we just we don't pray as often because we don't need to, or do we? 
But when things go south, guess what? We start piling on the prayer, don't we? Jesus is really trying to teach us all this morning. Prayer is just as important and just as needed all the time. Because prayer is not just about asking God when things are bad. Prayer should be more about praising God when things are good and praising God when trials of various sorts, the Bible says in the book of James, come to you. Rejoice, the Bible says, because knowing that the testing of your faith is producing perseverance. And God will give you wisdom in abundance if you just call out to Him. Because if you don't, what does it say? You'll be like a drunk man just trying to walk on the storms and the waves tossed back and forth. Isn't that a beautiful picture of prayer? I heard a man say, when trials come, don't wring your hands, just bend your knees. Dr. Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite, favorite pastor and preacher, says, courage, watch this, courage is nothing but fear who has said its prayers. Ask any soldier who's been out in the middle of a war and did something courageous to win the Medal of Honor. Courage is nothing but fear who all of a sudden said its prayers and then did something amazing. Dr. Billy Graham again says, prayer is the highest and only use of the human language. Nothing will drive us to our knees quicker than trouble. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. The three verbs in that text is ask, seek, and knock. If you take the first letter of each of those verbs, what's it spell? It spells ask. Matthew Henry in his commentary says this, The church is often like a ship at sea, tossed and with every wind and every wave, and not comforted. We may have Christ for us, yet the wind and tide is against us. But it is a comfort to Christ's disciples that when he or she is in a storm, that their master is in the heavenly mount interceding for them. And no difficulties can hinder Christ's appearance for his people when the set time has come. Jesus knows where we're at at all times, but He knows exactly when He needs to show up in the middle of that storm, just like He did here with the disciples. I love Psalm 50, verse 15. I would highly encourage you to memorize this text because you're going to need it. Psalms 50, verse 15 says, Call upon Me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify Me. Wow. Wow. That's your umbrella when the storm clouds are gathering. Psalm 50, verse 15. And then I'm going to close with this. I'm not doing bad considering that this is a two-part sermon. I know, I, I know. Sometimes God allows things to happen in our life to bring our faith under review. His review, by the way, not others' review. I don't need someone to review my faith. I don't need to review your faith, but what I need is for my faith, my life to be put under the perfect holy gaze of God, right? Sometimes he does it to rebuke my pride. Sometimes he does it to resurrect my prayer life. And then lastly, simply sometimes God wants to remind us of his power. I love it when God shows off. We see that here in our story in verse 31 through 33. Jesus immediately reached out in his hand and took, a, took um, hold of Peter, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And what Jesus is saying there is, Why did you doubt me? He's not saying, Why did you why were you afraid of the storm or what? He, Jesus understands we're human, but he says, why in that did you doubt me? See, that's the rebuke. And then look at what 
Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, watch this, the wind ceased. The wind, the rain, and the waves became as glass. Because of the power of God. Just hours before, they had witnessed the power of God when Jesus fed. And by the way, I want to. I'm. I'm going to take just a minute because I want you to get this picture when he's feeding the five thousand. Jesus is say here. And his disciples are like right here, but then there's this sea of people. Did, when's the last time you saw ten to 20,000 people? Maybe at a concert? I don't know. But imagine in Hebrew culture, Jesus standing here. I'm, a, I'm about to preach myself into encouragement. Jesus standing here, the church standing here, and the world standing here. And they would have been dressed in that day in the Hebrew dress, which would have been multicolors. So as Jesus looked out, and as the disciples looked out, it would have looked like a, a field of flowers. And Jesus says, sit down. And I know the disciples are saying, oh boy, this is going to be the one that gets him. I know he's good. And I've seen him do some good things. But it's one thing to change a bunch of water into wine. How in the world? You know, I can see him. And then this little boy, faith of a child, walks up and says, Well, I can't do nothing with these few loaves of bread and these two dried up stinky fish, but I think Jesus can. But here's what I want you to see about the feeding of the 10, 15, 20,000 people. Do you see in that text how it happened? No. Here's what I think happened. Jesus takes this fish, this one fish, and by the way, they're about this long. And he hands it to this person. You see, they would have sat in family groups. And he hands it to the man, right? The father. And as the man turns to hand it to his wife, it just doubles. And as the wife hands it to her babies, it just keeps doubling and doubling and doubling. When it works itself all the way to the back, there's stuff left over. Only God can do that. Now, I know Jesus didn't say this, but if I'd have been Jesus, I'd have said, watch this. You know, God. If Jesus can save you, He can heal you. If Jesus can save you, He can deliver. If Jesus... Why do we forget how powerful our God is? And then, there, honestly, I, I know I've said this, but here, here's the last thing I want to tell you. Mark fills in a blank here that we don't see in Matthew. In Mark 6.52, listen to, what, listen to what he says. For they did not understand. Now, they're in the middle of the ocean going through. For they did not understand about the loaves. So because of that, their hearts were hardened. See, they had just seen this miracle. Now they're in the middle of a storm and they had forgot what he'd just done with feeding these people that he would he still had the power to do here. The Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long and about 7 miles wide. And we know from putting the Gospels together that they had rowed about 3 to 4 miles, John says. So they were out there in the middle. The power of God, it's nothing. 
He did this on shore. He can do it out here. So sometimes it's just to remind us that our God is powerful. So, so as we prepare for our invitation this morning, let me, let me just remind you of something. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe nothing. You still got a reason to pray. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But you still have a reason to pray. But let's say you're going through something right now. Like our family's going through some tough times right now. That's why your pastor is in Ohio. Sometimes, could it be just that God wants to lovingly reach down and say to us, have faith, humble yourself, Have faith because I'm God and you're not. Humble yourself because I'm God and you're not. Pray because my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. But above all, I'm God. You're my child. I will not let anything happen to you out of my sight because I'm all-powerful Jehovah. I'm going to pray for us if you bow your head this morning. And as you bow your head and as you close your eyes, I want you to get alone with God for just a second. Son, Mom, Steve, bow your head. Get alone with God for just a second. Let him speak into you right now that he knows he can and he cares. There may be someone in this place this morning who's never experienced the power unto salvation. So you have no idea what this looks like. I'm going to pray that God calls you unto salvation and repentance this morning. And all you need to do is step forward in faith and trust the finished work of Jesus Christ and receive Him as Master and Lord today. Be born again. You may be going through something this morning. Know that it has a purpose. Whatever your need is today, God can handle it. So I'm going to encourage you to, to, to step forward and hit the altar as a sign of trust. Or kneel right there where you're at it in your pew and cry out to a holy God. There's a reason for the rain. And His name is Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, Oh, thank you, Father, for your word, because your word teaches us and, 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 and your word tells us that it makes every man, woman and child complete and perfect for every good work in Christ Jesus. I want to thank you for First Baptist Church of Gracemont, Lord, and, and the light that it is in this community. But, you know, all of us, Father, uh, all of us run into life from time to time, and, and it shakes the strongest oak tree. So my prayer this morning, Father, is that a soul would be saved. I pray, Father, this morning that, a, that someone would be touched and, and set free from whatever it is they're going through, that they would see the significance of who you are in their life, and that their ways are not your ways and your thoughts are not their thoughts. God, just please be God this morning. We invite you in and give you praise, honor, and glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? And uh, Brother David is going to come up and lead us. And I'm just going to.